Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. I'm Jennifer Gunn. I'm the director of the Institute for Advanced Study. And welcome to IAS Thursdays. Today's event is a very special one, and it's a partnership with Northrop, our friends, and a place that we hope to get back to soon. I'd like to start by remembering that the University of Minnesota is located on traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of indigenous people. The university resides on Dakota land seated in the treaties of 1837 and 1851. The Institute for Advanced Study acknowledges this place has a complex and layered history. This land acknowledgement is one of the ways in which we work to educate the campus and community about this land and our relationships with it and with each other. The IAS is committed to ongoing efforts to recognize, support, and advocate for American Indian nations and peoples. I think it's probably appropriate uh, for our topic today that we are um, that we are marking a year of unprecedented um, social organization and many uh, many losses. But before we get to that, I'll just make a few announcements. Next week, uh, not the same Zoom link, but the same time, uh, we will be having a program on our Spotlight series, Reli Religious Identities and Polarization. And we invite you to join us next week. Um, also next week on Friday, March 19th, for those of you who were here last Friday, we're going to have a, a reading group discussion with, with author Chris Pexa of his book, Translated Nation, Rewriting the Dakota Oyate. Um, so please sign up for that if you're interested. And finally, I'll just give us a few Zoom instructions before I introduce our moderator and, um, and some of our speakers for today. So this is a Zoom webinar, which means that you can't unmute or, uh, or be seen, um, but you can still enter questions. You need to enter your questions and you're welcome to do so at any time during the pre uh, presentation in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. At the end of the presentation, our moderator, Virajita Singh, will read the questions questions to the panelists. So feel free to enter them at any time, but they will be grouped and read at the end of the presentation. And finally, if you would like subtitles, click on the live transcript box on the bottom of your uh, bottom bar of your, your computer screen and click show subtitles. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce our mod moderator for today, Virajita Singh. Virajita is Associate Vice Provost in the Office of Equity and Diversity at the University of Minnesota, where she brings her expertise in design thinking and partnership studies to catalyze and support equity and diversity work in the colleges and other academics at academic units at the university. Trained as an architect, Virajita is also senior research fellow and faculty member in the College of Design and the Center for Sustainable Building Research, where she founded and leads the Design for Community Resilience Program. She also serves as a co-convener of the IAS Research and Creative Collaborative Religion and the Public University. Inspired by her long-standing interest in the topic of religion, Virajita has taught architecture courses that explore the intersection of architecture, environment, religion, and religious spaces, both on campus and as study abroad courses. But before I hand the program over to Virajita, I would also like to introduce Rani Ramaswamy and Aparna Ramaswamy, who provided much of the inspiration for today's event. Rani and Aparna Ramaswamy are artistic directors of the Twin Cities-based Ragamala Dance Company, founded by Rani in 1992. Ragamala is a woman-led, family-run organization driven by a quest for artistic excellence and deep engagement. Rani and Aparna's work has toured widely 
and they have been awarded prestigious Guggenheim Fellowships, Doris Duke Artistic Awards, McKnight Fellowships, among many others, in recognition of their creative vision. <coughs> Sorry. Today's discussion is inspired by and rooted in Rani and Aparna's newest work, Fires of Varanasi, which will have its Minnesota premiere in Northrop's 21-22 season, 2021-2022. Fires of Varanasi is commissioned by the Kennedy Center, the Harris Theater in Chicago, the Hopkins Center for the Arts at Dartmouth, the Soraya in Southern California, Northrop in Minneapolis, Gogu and Performing Arts Center at Auburn University in Alabama, the American Dance Festival, and Meany Center in Seattle. So I'll now hand over the, pro the program to Rani and Aparna to share more about this work and how the fires of Varanasi's stage work was the impetus for our conversation here today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm very, very happy to be here um, and grateful to the Northrop for our partnership around fires of Varanasi and the many points of inspiration we have been able to explore this year. As mother and daughter, we create stage works rooted in the dance language of Bharatanatyam, a classical form from the South Indian state of Tamil Nadu. We draw from the artistic traditions and spirituality of our Indian heritage. And through our work, we explore topics of cultural transmission, immigrant experiences, and diasporic life through an intergenerational lens. Through our newest work, Fires of Varanasi, Dance of the Eternal Pilgrim, we contemplate the Hindu conviction that life and death are an integrated whole. Everything that grows and is nurtured will perish one day. Hindus are raised with a deep reverence for the divine and the belief that life is temporary and impermanent, and therefore so is suffering. An intense awareness of death heightens the value of life lived meaningfully with devotion, compassion, and generosity towards others. This is an essential tenet of Hindu philosophy. The death of my grandfather away from his homeland five years ago illuminated for us a new aspect of the immigrant experience. He was a devout Hindu who firmly believed in the Hindu conviction that life and death are an integrated whole. Like his ancestors before him, he wished for his ashes to be scattered in the Ganges River in the sacred city of Varanasi, India. We see our production of Fires of Varanasi as a ritual for the stage that honors the sacred pilgrimage city of Varanasi, also known as the City of Light. The city is known for its pilgrimage routes, the mythic Ganges River, the patron deity Shiva, and the auspicious cremation grounds. And for us, those became symbols for spiritual and physical transcendence. We envision today's conversation one that brings together faith and community leaders when we first conceived of this work. And the grief, death, mourning, and the need for resilience brought on by the global pandemic has made this dialogue feel even more urgent. We are so thankful to our hosts, the Northrop and IAS, moderator Virajita Singh, and our panelists, Rabbi Liberman, Mark Markel, and Govind Namudripad for taking the time to share your ex expertise with us today. And I'd like to now pass it on to Virajita. Thank you so much, Rani and Aparna. Uh, it's my great pleasure and honor to moderate this session, Talking to the Dead, an interfaith panel discussion on life and death. And I thank IAS for creating the space in their IAS Thursdays for the conversation and reflection on this important topic. I also thank our audience for making time to be here for this conversation. Before I introduce our three wonderful panelists, I would like to frame the discussion with a few points of my own. First, the fact that the topic of death and dying has been inescapably on our minds through the pandemic, as Jennifer and Aparna and Rani mentioned, both glo globally, nationally, and locally. 
We have been forced to confront COVID deaths daily in the news and our professional and family networks uh, while being kept away from our loved ones during their real transition. We're also grappling with the fact that death, which is considered a great leveler, has also been a more frequent visitor disproportionately visiting Black, Indigenous, and communities of color, thus exposing our inequities. Second, I'd like to suggest that our culture in the United States, broadly speaking, has always been, been somewhat skittish, if you will, about death and dying. While every culture and subculture engages the questions of death and dying, and the questions of eternity differently. Perhaps our culture has been obsessed by the question of eternity through a resistance to aging, a denial of death, and a pursuit of youth. And this has made the COVID context even more shocking to our collective systems. Third, I'd like to offer a context for the discussion of religion and faith in our conversation. Religion is com complex, as is often apparent in the discussions in the religion and public university that Professor Jean, Jeannie Kildee and I co-convene. Bruce Lincoln in his book, Holy Terrors, Thinking About Religion After September 11, points out that the definition of religion attends to four domains. One, that it is a discourse whose concerns transcend the human, temporal, and contingent that claims a transcendent status. Two, that it, which means any religion is a set of practices. Three, that religion involves a community whose members construct their identity with reference to the religious discourse and practices. And fourth, a religion has institutions that regulate the discourse, practices, and community. This means that religion and all religions are an interplay of those four domains. And it is helpful to listen for these domains as the con in the context of the conversation that will follow. And finally, I'd like to say that our gathering attempts to bring different perspectives. And due to the limitations of time and space, it's always only a part of the whole. So I hope you will use the glimpses into these perspectives to reconnect to the whole of your experience of religion, faith, death, and dying. And with that, I'm going to introduce each of our panelists. Um, I'll start with Rabbi Lynn Liberman. Rabbi Lynn Liberman was ordained from the Jewish Theological Seminary of America in 1993 and served as a congregational rabbi for over 20 years. Currently, Rabbi Liberman is a board certified chaplain working as a community chaplain for the Jewish Family Service of St. Paul and as a staff chaplain for Accent Care Fairview Hospice in addition to serving as an on-call chaplain for Regents Hospital Gillette Children's Hospital and M Health Fairview Hospitals. Rabbi Liberman has taught and worked in a variety of educational settings, including Jewish day schools as an adjunct lecturer in Judaics at Augsburg's College, Minneapolis, as well as a current faculty member of the Melton Adult Learning Program through Hineni. Currently, she also volunteers as a police and a fire chaplain for Mendota Heights, West St. Paul Police and Fire Departments, is an ARC spiritual care disaster responder, is on the Metro CISM team, is on the Children's Hospital Ethics Committee, and on the executive board of Neshama Association of Jewish Chaplains. So welcome Rabbi Lynn Liberman. I'll introduce Mark Markel next. Mark Markel is an interna internationally known author, educator, and speaker for his work in education, learning disabilities, psychology, grief, and death. Mark earned his doctorate from the University of Minnesota in educational psychology and holds several related professional certifications, including as a professional development specialist, the natologist, crematory operator, funeral arranger, and celebrant, along with a certificate in death and grief studies. He published numerous articles in the area of his educational specialization, which include learning and behavioral difficulties, positive behavior strategies, liter literacy for students with disabilities, psychology, grief, and death education. He's current faculty at Warsham College of Mortuary Science, where he teaches psychology with an emphasis on funeral service. People of all ages and backgrounds attend Mark's grief and loss workshops that provide focus for care providers, individuals with cognitive 
learning or behavioral disabilities and those making funeral arrangements and those who have experienced tragic loss. Welcome, Mark. And finally, um, Godan Nambudiripad, born and raised in tropical Kerala state on the southwest corner of India in a Rigvedic family. He came to North America in 1967. Legend is that the mother on Shankara, the eighth century Hindu philosopher who is also often considered as the first per person to work for the national integration of India was from his family. An engineer with graduate degree from the University of Toronto, Canada, Godan retired in 2007 as an engineering manager from General Mills, now a longtime resident of Minnesota. He has served as the president of Silk School of India for Language and Culture and the India Association of Minnesota. For the last few years, he has been leading tours of the Hindu Mandir of Maple Grove and has also been invited to talk to students in K through 12 and colleges on Hinduism. Working with the Minnesota Historical Society, Godan started an oral history project to record the stories of Indians who made Minnesota their home. This includes a history of Ragamala. Godan has worked with Ragamala and Rani Ramaswamy for the past four decades, including serving as the president of the board for a period. In addition, he was instrumental in creating a book on Vedic rituals as practiced in Kerala, and he has managed or been involved in a dozen funerals in the US. So welcome, Godan, as well. So I'm going to start with turning uh, over to Rabbi Lynn Liberman so she can tell us about uh, her perspectives. Thank you and uh, good afternoon. It's a beautiful day outside. I was thinking about uh, this uh, conversation today and where I began to um, really give consideration to what end of life means. And I, I recall that when I was in grade school, so it's quite a few years ago now, uh, a friend of mine's father died tragically. And I was, I was really uh, grade school, so I was pretty young. And my mother turned to me and said, it told me what happened. I was very sad for my, my friend. And then said, um, do you wanna go to the funeral? She says, I'm not certain if it's a good thing for you to do, but I, I'm gonna ask if you'd like to do that. Mm -hmm. And I said, yes. Um, and I think uh, I've always uh, been so grateful to my parents, the way they have raised me and uh, allowed me to learn in a variety of ways. And when I think back uh, with um, being so young and being so introduced to the rituals of my faith, how grateful I am, even for that moment of experience. Um, just by way of touching on a few aspects of what I do and how it integrates into the Jewish tradition, uh, I, uh, I do work in hospice and uh, kind of stumbled into that work actually, uh, but I'm uh, probably stumbled in with, with good reason. Uh, the uh, holy space that is um, part of that work where I am really, it's a sense of privilege uh, to sit with those who are at the end of their life, approaching the end of their life, to be present to them in that space, to the individual, to their family, their circle, as I like to think of it, is a, a, a regular reminder of the spectrum of life, the span of life, and that the end of life is what we are moving toward from the moment, as a professor of mine said uh, some years ago, from the moment that we're born, we're moving in that direction. And um, that's the reality, that's the living reality. And I'm so grateful in my hospice work to really receive the wisdom of the people who I am with, even today, a 92 year old woman who just smiled and said, I'm okay. And it just reminds me of, of that space and place that we all occupy in the world. Um, it truly is in the Jewish perspective, that sense that we are going to die. What we are most engaged in though, is with the reality that we are living. And that's where we actually put our attention in time. Um, we know that death is going to come. It's the end of this time here on this earth. And in Judaism, we, we sometimes say the saddest part of dying is that we no longer are able to do the uh, very uh, specific tasks that demonstrate our love for our fellow human beings and for God, which are called mitzvot. And that's the sadness. We don't know what's on the other side, if you will, but we're also not um, dwelling on that. 
really very much more dwelling on this world in which I am and the differences that I can make in my life, but my life in particular as, it, as it's relative to others. That's, a, that's very important to recognize that space of living is um, not just, I'm, I'm not just in a cocoon, for example. Um, one of the things that uh, has really taught me also a uh, significant uh, uh, intimate understanding of death is that uh, we have a, and if I have time, we'll perhaps come back to this or a question. We have a, a, a way of honoring our deceased through a commitment and it's generally by, by members of their own community to help for the burial of the deceased. And so I am part of my community's Kevra Kadisha, which is a sacred burial society. And I've been doing that for a number of years now. I did this before I came to Minnesota and find that in that sacred space, uh, again, another space of where we treat with incredible attention to holiness and to a sacred sense of uh, wanting to care for the deceased with the utmost honor, uh, an understanding of the preciousness of this life. And yet this body that we are preparing for burial by washing and dressing and appropriately placing in the, in the casket um, is no longer a part of this world in that sense of what animates a person and that which animates the person is the soul. And that has, uh, in, in a terminology we would say has gone back to God. So I would just uh, add two more things um, at this point. One is um, this uh, sort of approaching the end of life is uh, two, two pieces. The first is that total respect for the deceased, to honor them, uh, to afford them kavod, as we say in honor, and to uh, tremendous respect through the time of the burial. And then at the cemetery, in fact, at a certain point, we change our attention and our rituals and we are putting our focus on the survivors, the family or whoever is in that circle with our interest in understanding what their needs are. And here we are very rich in traditions on both sides, the care for the deceased as well as the care for the survivors. And our attention is to how to help them to go through the journey of grief and to uh, be with them in that process. And as I said, uh, our ritual life is very strong in this regard um, and has a lot to do with supporting us um, as we journey through that process of grief. Thank you so much, Rabbi. I'm going to invite Mark Markel to make his comments. All right. Thank you, Rajnita. Um, as um, was said in the introduction, I'm a professor and I'm both in the Department of Special Education at St. Cloud State and I teach at Warsham College of Mortuary Science in Illinois. That's an online program. And at Warsham, I, I teach psychology with an emphasis in funeral service and all the topics that we talk about come back to how is that going to relate to you as a funeral director uh, when you become licensed. I do quite a bit of work in the area of people with disabilities and grief and also their involvement in funeral services. For three years, I taught at the University of Minnesota in mortuary science, and I taught religious diversity in death and dying and cultural diversity in death and dying, and also co-taught um, a class on funeral arrangements. Though I'm not a funeral director, I am a certified thanatologist, which is the study of death, dying, and grief and I'm certified in death and grief studies. And so I get to do a whole bunch of different things such as teach and conduct workshops and do writing. And um, it's just a very exciting um, field for me. My father died when I was five years old and that was the most traumatic event that happened in my life. And that's why I do the work that I do in uh, death and dying. I was raised Roman Catholic and looking back, I don't think Catholicism was ever a good fit for me. I disagreed with many of the teachings of the church from a young age. I disagreed with how women were not able to be priests. I disagreed with the church about LGBTQ people. And I didn't believe in the concept of sin as the Catholic church teaches it. I, um, I know with the Catholic church, there are a lot of rituals around death and dying. Uh, for instance, uh, there would be the anointing of the sick as somebody is approaching death, which used to be referred to as the last rites. And then during the funeral, um, there's a lot of prescribed types of things that need to happen. 
in more recent years, the Catholic Church that used to be very opposed to the uh, concept of cremation now allows cremation, but only under certain circumstances in terms of the cremated remains need to be buried uh, fully in the Catholic cemetery. So somebody couldn't take um, a part of the cremated remains and, and have them in an urn at their home or, or somewhere else. As I got older, I started looking for a church that fit who I was and what my concept of, of theology is. And I found a very progressive Christian church. We don't have dogma and the members very, very um, vary in their different beliefs. Most would identify as Christian, but some identify as agnostic and even a few as a atheist. Though they don't believe in God, they do like the community and they also like the work that we do in social justice. As with many progressive churches, we did not talk about death and dying very often. And I think that the reason that we didn't talk about death very much is because unlike more traditional Christian churches, we don't have a very firm belief of heaven and hell. And we're more concerned about the kingdom of God on earth than what, we, than what happens after death. However, there was a small group, and there still is a small group of us, um, including one of the ministers, who are drawn to do more in the uh, area of death and dying. And we started a group called Threshold Ministry. At first, we didn't really know what we wanted to do, but after a lot of discussion and a lot of meetings, we um, kind of evolved. And after some careful planning and intentional timing, we put together some things um, and we have put together a ritual for honoring the blessed body. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later because in the time of COVID, it isn't as um, possible to actually go and be with the body and with the survivors in the same room. And so we put together a ritual that could be done by Zoom. We also, um, I started teaching a class on death education for non-grieving children to second graders and sixth and seventh graders. My sister and I actually teach those classes. And we also, as a threshold ministry group, we put together a reader's theater. Um, we collected stories from congregants about their experience with death of a significant person, specifically stories about experiences right after the death and interacting with the blessed body. And um, we plan to do more and more in that area of death education and, and death dialogue. And so we're planning to hold some death cafes in the near future. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'll now invite Godan to make his comments. Uh, namaste. Uh, I'm uh, thankful to Rani Ramaswamy, Ragamala, and also to the Institute of Advanced Studies at the university for inviting me for this uh, seminar. This is some area that I wanted to study. And so this gave me an uh, opportunity to look into uh, more on, on this. Uh, I have no uh, academic background on death. So all the things that I learned about death, dying, all those things are from my own experience and reading books. So that's what I'll be sharing. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, from the very beginning, uh, early childhood, you knew about death because people dying uh, nearby or relatives or whoever. And we have a unique uh, uh, idea about death. As Rani was saying uh, that there's a life after death. Uh, death, is, uh, death and life is only a short time we are here. When I said namaste, what uh, I'll st start from that. Basically what I said is the divinity in me acknowledges or salutes the divinity in you. So it's the divinity, we call it Atman, which is uh, I think uh, almost similar to soul, that Atman is what keeps us alive. This Atman, which is the divinity, divine force, is 
uh, a sliver of the universal uh, living force called Paramatman. So what we have is a part of the uh, part of the whole, uh, and the ultimate aim of the life of the Atman is to go back and reach that Paramatman or the universal soul. So what happens after death? After death, the soul goes and, uh, or the Atman goes and lives in another body. Why does it do that? Because the Atman is not pure enough to go to the universal Atman. The work you do, we call it the result of that, we call it karma, is attached to the Atman and you have to purify uh, that Atman before it can reach the ultimate, uh, the universal Atman. Uh, but uh, death is not the end of it. We can, uh, we can do, do it in many more lives. So if it, does, if it doesn't work out this, this uh, life, you can do it in the next life. So death is almost like uh, uh, the Atman discarding used clothes. Our body is the used clothes, it's discarded, Atman goes to somewhere else. So that's the concept. Now, uh, I'm gonna go through the funeral part of it a little bit here. Uh, that is a funeral, is a getting rid of the body as quickly as possible. Uh, the, uh, it should be cremated before uh, one and a half days is kind of the, if, if at all possible. It should not be embalmed. And it has been a little difficult here sometimes because you have to have the death certificate and all that, but at least in Minnesota, uh, even on sa Sundays, uh, the uh, county offices are sometimes open enough to do that kind of work. So you cremate it, then what happens uh, to that soul? The idea is that that uh, uh, soul sticks around for a uh, few days, 10 to 12 days. And there are rituals which the children or the relatives of the departed do. And those rituals are to help that Atman to go and meet the ancestor, ancestral Atmans who are in the ultimate, uh, the infinite Atman. So those uh, 10 days are preparations for the journey. Then around 13th day, there's a very important ritual. That ritual is um, uh, joining this uh, departed soul with the souls of the ancestors in the ancestral, the world where the ancestral souls Side. So at 13th day, everything is over. It's a happy day, 13th day, because the, uh, the departed dear soul has reached there. Now, now what happens after that? For uh, usually most people do uh, a annual uh, uh, ritual inviting that uh, departed soul to come and uh, bless us. So that's on that exact anniversary of the, the death. Uh, then in some uh, traditions, we also remember the departed every day. I do myself by offering water every day. Now, this, these parts are similar uh, throughout India, but Think about this, India is a, uh, has something like 6,000 or so, 5,000, 6,000 um, uh, jatis or castes or uh, groups of people and uh, the uh, 150 languages, set land of, and also along with that, there's about 750 or so tribes. So when you say Hindu, this is an umbrella which catches all this uh, diversity. So, but I, I'm not going to get into all that diversity because I, uh, we don't have the time and I don't know have the knowledge. 
but basically uh, i'm going to talk about from my experience and uh, but these basic principles that i told you they are the same uh, and there is a vedic kind of rituals and non vedic rituals and even in vedic rituals there are many variations so what the priest does is the priest adjusts the rituals to that particular family tradition um and i will get into the details about my experience uh, of my, uh, of handling deaths here and what it would have been if the death were in india and all that at a later time virajda thank you thank you so much godan um i i think we can go on to questions i i'm going to start with some questions and invite um the audience to also um enter um questions in the q and a thank you jennifer for in that invitation in the chat um and i'm going to start with i i think godan you talked about rituals um so maybe i just wanted to allow uh the opportunity for mark and the rabbi um to add and my question is this tell us more about the rituals related to death and dying in your religion and context for example what happens in the days leading to someone's death and what happens after someone dies is there uh anything you'd like to add maybe we can start with the rabbi thank you um yeah uh i would probably uh, divide it up in just how um that is leading up to death and then uh at the time of the funeral so for the deceased uh, again our attention is really toward their living and at the moment of death our attention then is for their honor uh, the honor of the deceased uh, many people know that in the jewish tradition our perhaps most sacred object is a torah scroll uh, we we uh, use it um, to read from every week and when we cannot use it any longer we actually bury it in the ground that's what we do with all of our sacred texts um the body the deceased body has that same holiness and so when it is no longer able to contain a soul uh, uh that body is then prepared to be buried so just a really quick overview of some of those rituals and then how the funeral happens uh, i mentioned before that i i am part of our community's khabra kadisha that's the sacred burial society um it is a tremendous honor to be a part of that uh we kind of operate um sort of a known to each other but not always known beyond us uh because we do our work for the sake of it needing to be done for the other there are a number of times where we know that there are actions we take for which we will never receive a thank you this is one of those and we don't expect it um and it's really to um place the uh, individual in the state of uh, preparedness for burial one of the unique aspects of this is it doesn't matter if you were the uh, prime minister of the state of israel or you were a street sweeper everybody is prepared exactly the same and uh the uh, clothing that you're placed in is very simple uh it doesn't have any uh uh stitching except for running stitches because it should uh be natural the casket that we use is also one that is usually plain wood or at least wood without metal implements in it and the idea is burial in the ground uh if you know the biblical verse we uh, came from the dust and we we go back to the dust and then along the way we have people who stay with the body to uh provide a sense of protection and we call it shmira of it not being uh left alone until the actual burial and that does include in our community and i'm sort of speaking pre covid but we have modified that and perhaps we'll talk about some of those modifications in a, in a few minutes uh but during covid we've modified it but we would somebody would sit at the funeral home with the deceased in the casket until the time of burial it's quite remarkable and these are all volunteers in our community who would do this um the funeral itself then begins an interesting uh time of transition and again filled with rituals we have the family there if we were without covid so i'll just say it in that time we hope to return to um that the family uh follows as does the community the casket being brought to the grave um but i'll just point out it's very interesting that we take seven steps uh seven uh pauses uh along the way to demonstrate our hesitancy we know this is what we're going to do but we don't have any great you know joy in doing it we we demonstrate our reluctance 
the um, family is um, going to participate in Kriya. It's a ceremony of tearing clothing. Traditionally, when you learned of the death of a loved one, you would actually rend your clothing. And people can still do that. And, and there are many who will do that. Um, and then that, that shirt or that jacket is worn throughout um, the period, the big first period of mourning. Today, you'll see a lot of ribbons being used as well. Um, the person is ripped away from our life. And there's much to say about the meaningfulness to that. And I'm, I'm gonna sort of leave that. The service will continue with appropriate liturgy um, and chesped, which is uh, words to honor. Um, and I always like to say, as I officiate and work with families that we only have the space to begin the process of telling the story, the memory. And that is where this person will continue to live, right? They live in here, uh, their body is gone, but they live with us. And when we tell their story, we are holding them still close and we still learn from them. We still have them very much in our life. And that funeral moment is the very beginning of that process. And then we have a few interesting transitional moments here. We actually bury our own. Again, we show our reluctance to do this. The casket is lowered, uh, further prayers are said. Many people have heard of the word Kaddish prayer. It's probably the most well-known one. Uh, but then we take shovel in hand and showing our reluctance, we turn it over and we put at least three shovelfuls of earth onto the casket. That sound is defining. What um, has been said to me by families I've worked with and others report is that when you hear the sound of the earth on the casket, sometimes later when you don't sort of have the sense that this person is truly gone, it's a profound reminder that we have placed with great kavod, with great dignity, our loved ones into the earth and that that is final. And now we are moving forward. And that moving forward does begin at the cemetery. This is also really um, a transitional moment. As soon as the casket has been uh, placed in the ground and earth has been buried, we actually turn our attention to the survivors, to those who are the circle of mourners. And we begin that process by having those who are there lining up facing each other and the family leaves the cemetery by walking between this rows of people. And there's some uh, traditional words of comfort that are said. And what that means is it's a symbolic statement of you're not alone. You're going to begin this journey. And the journey is beginning by leaving the cemetery and simply going home. And then very quickly, we have a series of uh, rituals and um, understandings. The family will be at home for, you might know the term Shiva, seven days traditionally, where the family stays cocooned in the security and safety of their house. They have an opportunity to do the work of grief, to actually spend time dwelling on the fact of this loss and thinking about what it means to them. The community comes to them. We come in a prayer service. We bring that quorum, which we have to have for our traditional prayers, we bring it to the family um, and uh, also provide one other very unique thing is that when you enter the house, and this is so not our human nature, but what we do is we enter quietly and we wait and receive whatever the person says to us. And when I teach this, I always say there is nothing that we have to bring that's going to be more important than what the other person says to us. And if they say, I'm wondering how the baseball game game is going. That's where you begin the conversation. If they say, I'm really, really distraught over my loved one, that's what you receive, right? So it's really where they are at. And that period is seven days. And then they re-enter the scope of living and they come back to work gently, 30 days and finally a year. And then I'll just mention, and perhaps we'll have a chance to come back to this, that in the course of the year, a pro profound aspect of our grieving process is that we are designating moments where we are going to say, I am grieving, I feel loss, I feel sadness, I feel disruption to my life and all the things that are associated with grief. So that is to come and say, hopefully in a community, we call that a minion, a prayer service, a certain prayer, that Kaddish prayer. We do that for approximately a year on a daily basis in the most traditional homes uh, for people, even up to three times a day. And then we have uh, the uh, Memorial Days where we recall specifically that individual disease. So it includes the date of their death, a year from the time of their burial, plus um, several other times in the calendar, four other times where we specifically have prayers to remind ourselves of those who have, we have lost and to spend time thinking about them and being motivated to continue to live our lives by the lessons that they have taught us to do acts of justice, acts of tzedakah, of charity, 
and acts of goodness for others. Thank you. Thank you so much. There, there's a follow-up question that I'll loop back again um, for you that's in the uh, Q&A. But in the meantime, Mark, uh, I wonder if you could respond to this question that's uh, come up. Uh, what do you think are some of the similarities relating to death between each of the religions? But I also wanted to take your perspective from a mortuary science and seeing diversity in the religions uh, perspective. You know, uh, that's thank you. That's a that's a really interesting question because one of the things that I know that I teach um, future funeral directors is that though there are specific rituals and traditions that each religion may hold, that we really don't know an individual person's preferences and beliefs unless we talk to that individual person. And so it could very well be that someone comes in to do funeral arrangements and they say, well, I belong to Seventh-day Adventists. And the funeral director may know about Seventh-day Adventists, but they don't know what that person that is in front of them believes because they, they may have picked up different rituals and different traditions and different beliefs. Um, based on their, their uh, community, based on um, experiences they've had. And so one of the things that I would say is that, first of all, that every religion is going to be very diverse. Uh, as with Christianity, um, I will say I am a, a Christian, but that would be very, very different than somebody else who might say that they're Christian, who belongs to a more fundamentalist or traditional conservative uh, community of faith. And the other piece of it is that there has been a lot of mixing of religious beliefs and traditions and, and, um, and rituals with uh, individual people. The, the thing that um, I really appreciated in listening to Rabbi Liberman about the rituals of, of Judaism is that as a community uh, that I belong to in, in the church that I belong to, we, um, as I said, we, we weren't very fond about talking about death and, and dying for a very long time, and we're starting to. And we're trying to learn not only from Trish, Christian traditions, but traditions from other religions. Um, and certainly, a lot of things that you were saying um, resonated with, with my belief system and with other people that are in the community. And we're trying to not to take what people who are Jewish have done and take the tradition and use it for our own, but to say, how does this uh, ritual fit into um, our faith community and our beliefs? The other thing that I was thinking with rituals in our community is that um, we are very much um, on creating ritual as we go. Um, which is very different than having thousands of years of tradition and ritual. And um, the, the, um, I, I'll just share one experience. Um, we have a prayer ministry that um, it's a, like a prayer chain and, and we get notices, whoever wants to be on this, this uh, group, in this group, we get notices um, probably once a week saying uh, prayer requests. And when um, I was approached and asked if I would be interested in being part of this, um, my, my thought was, I don't really know for myself what prayer is. Um, you know, I wrote, grew up Roman Catholic and I can, I can recite the prayers. Um, but for me personally, I'm not sure what that meant. And what I was told was it is whatever you want it to be. And I felt very comfortable with that and said, sure, I can do that. <laughs> I, can, I can modify it to how I, how I pray. And so I suspect that even within this, this ritual of praying for people who are dying and have died in their families, that um, everybody in that group um, prays in a very different way. And prayer means something very different to each of us. And so it is kind of creating as we go. 
Thank you so much. Uh, again, so much nuances and differences, you know, within what se seems to be one aspect of it. Um, I'm going to go to Godan for the next questions. We have some great questions here in the uh, Q and A. Um, I'll read it to you. Um, could you elaborate on the cycle of reincarnation? When do new souls get created? Is there a constant amount of souls going through the cycle? What can we do in our lifetime to further purify our souls? A lot of great questions, Godan. Yeah, yeah. The whole of Hinduism in this almost. Uh, okay, the uh, the individual soul is called to be a reflection of the universal goal, uh, soul or Paramatman. Uh, it is like uh, you look at a uh, a uh, a lake with lot of uh, waves and see the sun reflected. So sun is only one, but it is reflected in all those uh, waves. So it's not individual souls are almost like separate and deity in that sense. So it's a reflection of that, uh, the universal soul. Uh, I hope that uh, answers that, that part of the question. Then what was it, the other part of the question? Um, when when new souls get created and is there a constant amount of them going through the cycle and right the that's i think i answered that yeah so the last one was uh, what can we do in our lifetime to further purify our souls uh, the uh, the whole religious uh, experience uh, religious rituals religious everything that you do rich do is to purify the soul uh we, we say that we go through many, what they call samskaras, which is uh, purifying rituals. Even marriage is a purifying ritual that purifies you, you the purifies the Atman. So uh, then there are uh, four parts basically given uh, as a possible choice. You know, Hinduism is a, uh, is uh, uh, like a cafeteria. You pick and choose the ones that fits your needs, your likes, your uh, you know inclinations, your abilities. So the four paths that are uh, one is um, uh, devotion or bhakti. Devo that's probably the easiest one because everybody is emotional and devotion is an emotion. So you have, then you can pe take a personal God like Krishna or Shiva or Ganesh or whatever, or without that. Uh, and that kind of devotion purifies your mind. The other one is uh, self uh, selfless service to other people. I guess that doesn't require a whole lot of explanation. Uh, then the other one is uh, what they call Raja Yoga or Yoga which is uh, basically conditioning your body and using, uh, using uh, uh, meditation to purify your uh, mind. Then the fourth one, which is considered the most difficult is, uh, uh, a, is a path of knowledge. Path of knowledge is the path, the knowledge that the Atman in you, uh, that is you, basically, and uh, the infinite Atman is the same. We are all part of the same. It's very easy to say. It's very easy intellectually to understand it. But uh, to really feel it and to really know it is very hard. So these are the four paths. And uh, just to add a, uh, a, a personal note to it, I try to use a little bit of each one of them <laughs> because uh, meditation is kind of fine to purify the mind. I like it. Uh, yoga to, for my body. And then uh, I take a little part of my time, uh, day for devotional activities. So, and then I try to learn from books to the path of knowledge. So, Take from the cafeteria, pick what you like. Thank you, uh, Godan. That's a great analogy. It sounded sounds like choose your own adventure. You know, 
through life. Um, I'm yeah, gonna... the, 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 that comes with a caveat though, but you have to make your decision. Nobody else will make the decision for you. That's right. So you take responsibility uh, for- Yeah, individual person. responsibility. So, uh, Hinduism is a highly individualistic religion or religious path. Not two people use the same, okay? That's right. Thank you so much. I'll come back. There's more questions for you, uh, Godan. But on the way, I'm going to go back to Rabbi for the next question. Um, it was a follow-up on the ritual, and maybe you answered it, but just wanted to be sure. Uh, is the body sacred because it has been a vessel in life as a daughter, son of the covenant, or another specific reason, because we are created by God? Yeah, it's a great question. It's, it's uh, really the latter part that you're alluding to, the person who asked the question. We are sacred because we are created by God. Um, I often will say it that when we come into this world, um, despite science helping people have fertility and therefore have children, but there's a piece of uh, extraordinary miracle in that moment. And so we don't have say over that moment per se in that way. And um, so likewise, this little body then grows up into this big body called the, the adult human being. And that's a sacred vessel. Um, and just to say it again, the piece um, that is really a, in our tradition, the way we say it, that is the real piece of divinity is that at the uh, moment of birth, the piece of divine is put into each of us, uh, the divine spark. So what does it mean to be made in the God's image is that in fact, when I look at another human being of any type, color, origin, religion, it, any human being, we all share that piece of divinity. And that is um, incredibly important to realize that's what makes us all uh, in that divine image, no matter how we manifest that on the outside. And so therefore we are to uh, bury that with that dignity, that body. Thank you, Rabbi. Um, I'm going to take a question that's further down and ask Mark. Um, it's addressed to any of the panelists. Um, if the life of the deceased has caused harm, trauma, is there a ritual that acknowledges that reality and rituals to help the survivors in their complex grief? I know that Godan uh, will have responses to that, but I wanted to start with you, Mark. So if the person who died has caused harm to others, is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. One of the things that I, um, that, I have found is very helpful and sometimes is difficult for survivors is to acknowledge the harm uh, during the eulogy, during the, um, during the funeral or memorial service in as gentle a way as, as can happen but to acknowledge that we're all human and that this person, as with many people, has caused harm to other people. Um, I think this is true for um, not only if a person has caused harm to others, but also it can um, also be carried out with the type of death that happens. So for instance, if the person died from a drug overdose or from suicide or, um, execution, <clears throat> that the acknowledgement that um, of the reality of the death of the person can be really helpful to heal and also can be helpful to take away and to um, dissipate some of the shame that is foisted on us by society um, for whatever feeling that might be that the survivors have. So I think just acknowledging it can be a very, very powerful way of, of dealing with a person who has died that has harmed others. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's really helpful to understand. Um, I wonder, Godan, if you wanted to speak to that. Um, Can you, you repeat, repeat the question again? Sure, uh, sure. If the life of the deceased has caused harm or trauma, is there a ritual that acknowledges that reality and also rituals to help the survivors in their complex grief because they're grappling with sort of the actions of the deceased? Uh, Hindu tradition really does not do a whole lot for the uh, 
the, the typical rituals don't <clears throat> do anything special for the surviving people. But uh, let me uh, take a little deviation here. Say somebody died, uh, somebody did, uh, uh, su somebody uh, committed suicide. Uh, the ritual is completely different for that person who did uh, that. First of all, we know that uh, that Atman will not go and uh, directly and uh, and uh, go into the <clears throat> world of ancestors uh, Atmans. So one of the thing that they do in the ritual is a prayer, almost an instruction or whatever, that hope in the next life something like uh, a situation like this will not happen to that person. And I'm told that if uh, somebody died of a snake bite, which was very common in our area, or in the olden days out of smallpox, this is the kind of uh, uh, ritual, uh, changes in the ritual that is done. Does that answer the question? <laughs> That's all I know about that. Uh, um, the per but uh, the a person who has done harm uh, only thing we can do think about is let me explain the uh, maybe a little bit about the process of death in Hinduism and there is a particular area where you could do something which is uh, if we know that somebody is going to die in the olden days by old age so uh, they are laid on a, uh, a, a bed of uh, uh, darbha grass, a particular type of grass, with the head towards the south, and, uh, and the, uh, uh, the, uh, there's a lamp there. And then uh, certain mantras are chanted, because if you can purify the person's mind as he goes you know, in the journey, that will help him uh, be, more. And uh, they knew you know, there is a particular rhythms of the, the uh, breathing. And from those rhythms, they know approximately when that person will die. In the olden days, people have observed it and they knew that. And towards the end, what they say is the, uh, the, the hearing, sense of hearing is the last to go. So they want the last uh, uh, thing that they uh, hear and probably in their mind is a, uh, the, the path to the ultimate, uh, the infinite Atman. So there is a, so a few mantras from Rigveda, which is a five or 6,000 year old one. And people who know that chant it in their ear. So uh, one of the thing is that if you think about God at the very end, if you have these kind of things at the end, he will be uh, quote unquote saved or he will be, he'll go to the, uh, the uh, uh, infinite Atman. Thank you so much. I, I would love to hear from the rabbi about this. And then uh, if you could also take the next question, which is uh, someone who is saying that they have a friend who is dying. And it's strange to describe it because we're all living, dying while we're living. And how can I support the friend? So if you could take both sort of the harm of, you know, caused by the deceased question, as well as that, that would be great. Um, yeah, I, this, is, this is a wonderful question. In, um, in the Jewish tradition, um, thankfully, we have the space to create new tradition as needed or new ritual as needed. And of course, everything that we do, we always wanna sink the roots as if they were coming from the very origins. And there, there we have some ways to do that. So the two things that come to mind are first, uh, those memorial times that I mentioned where we take some time out on certain, for example, holidays, and we have, it's called a Yiz Core service. It's uh, from the Hebrew word uh, to remember. And so we have a remembrance service and it's filled with uh, readings and prayers uh, and then the saying of that Kaddish prayer. And we do that to honor the deceased ones, right? 
the question is, what if my father was really not a good guy? So there's a prayer that has been written in that section of the prayer book, a piece of liturgy that for one who knows, I have a sense that I have to acknowledge my loss, but it maybe isn't the worst loss in the world. Maybe that harm was perpetrated against me. But our tradition has this idea that I'm supposed to honor that loss. This liturgy says, and it's very much what Mark also alluded to, this guy maybe wasn't so great but here are the things that I'm going to say. And it gives um, the space for the mourner in that moment uh, to uh, acknowledge that there has been loss to them. I, I didn't know, I wished I had brought the text with me. It's kind of extraordinary to see that. But the fact that the prayer book even creates a space for that moment is really wonderful and important. And um, often if we're in the congregational setting when the prayers are said, um, I've known the, 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 the rabbi leaders to say, just to acknowledge for some of you to know that on this page, when we have this silent space for these prayers, that this might be a choice you might like to make. And we kind of leave it there. The second thing though, that has also happened, and this is really gonna open up a can of worms and I'm afraid to do that. I'm just so, so you'll write me afterwards and ask. We have a tradition of the ritual bath um, and it's called a mikvah. And it, it had some very specific uses, but again, in this light, in this day of doing new things, it's a space of bringing about healing. So there are many times men and women who have experienced harm uh, perpetrated by a parent and other things too, but let's say in this case, a parent, that they'll go to that ritual bath and go through that immersion process. It is, if you will, just a, a little analogy. It is kind of like a rebirthing. And so that cleansing and coming out the other side gives some people a chance toward healing. Um, and again, I agree with Mark, a tremendous need for acknowledging that these things are part of our life. Um, the other question is, it's an important and beautiful question. It, it, it lets me speak as a chaplain um, in that space. So just um, perhaps one of the greatest gifts is the gifts of presence. Uh, and that means just simply showing up and being there with your, with your friend. Uh, again, listening for what they indicate to you they might need. Um, if they need to talk, then all you need to do, all you need to do is to listen and to receive their story. It's really a holy space. If they say to you, I, I really, really have a hankering, I need to taste some chocolate chip mint ice cream. Um, maybe that's something you can go and get for them and you bring it back. Maybe they'll have a little taste, maybe not. Um, or to assist with things that they point out to you. Um, one of the things that we know that happens when we get sick and enter into the dying process is that a um, different kind of loneliness comes along with that. Some people just, they don't know what to do. So that's why it's a beautiful question. So what do you do is you show up. Uh, and I will also then say, sometimes when you show up is to also be prepared to say, to hear, thanks, but not today. And to hear that with love and to know that the fact that you showed up was a real gift and today might not be the day that they need your presence. And it might be a phone call tomorrow and it might be actually a written letter. I mean, today when we can't really go see our friends so close and our loved ones so close, I, I as one in this is my work is I have written a tremendous amount, gone back to old school, but a beautiful thing because I've gotten responses from letters to people, just handwritten notes um, and um, staying in touch through the phone and otherwise. Thank you, Rabbi. You know, the reminder about presence and your last response is very powerful and also kind of honoring the person who is passing rather than our needs um, as those who are being left behind. Um, and, and so also it's hopeful to hear that um, different traditions have uh, flexibility as that you can write and rewrite and create, which is not always experienced. Um, uh, so much. So I see Godan would like to add something. Yeah, I, I, I want to add, this is not, <clears throat> when you asked about ritual, this is not part of a ritual, but uh, very much a tradition, which is, uh, uh, again, when I say tradition, it's in, uh, in that particular southwestern corner of India, that's our families, that may be another five, 6,000 different traditions. Anyway, uh, for the 10 days, you uh, or many days, you do not uh, cook, uh, cook in your home. And uh, after a few days, there is a, you don't cook with uh, salt. Uh, and that is hard on the body after a few days with no salt. 
and people bring food and even if they cook they cook very simple food without things so 10 days people come and visit and talk uh, and that is a tradition uh, so which is uh, help the grieving people then there is uh, also another tradition in some families which is to read one book called garuda purana which describes about death and uh, quite a bit of uh, it's, a, it's a very old book it you will probably read very strange these days but uh, uh, people tend to read some parts of it about uh, death and where the ancestors or the death that person goes and a lot of description about that Uh, sometimes that is right even during or right after the cremation ceremony thank you i'm going to ask uh, mark the next question and then come back to actually inviting rani and aparna to speak there's a question here um to them so um mark uh, the question was i was wondering if you witnessed deathbed visions where people see loved ones before they die um if so could you share a few stories you know um yes um actually it's interesting because i i belong to the association of deaf educators and counseling <clears throat> uh both the the international organization and the minnesota organization and on occasion they will have an entire conference dedicated to after death or not after death communication but um well extraordinary experiences like seeing a significant person or a loved one prior prior to dying um one that i can share um that i, I actually was told to me by my mother when my dad um when i was 5 years old my dad died and he was in the hospital for about a week prior to dying at the time we none of us children there were five of us ranging in age from 1 to 8 uh could go and visit him um but at one point he had been in a semi coma and he came out of the in came out of the coma and my mother was there and he said um that he was going to die and mom was saying well no you're not going to die and he said yes he said um i met with my mother and his mother had died a few years before um and she said that i just had a few more hours and then i was going to die and that it's it's wonderful it's wonderful where she is and so my mother said she just kind of thought well you know whatever this is just kind of him talking and he's been really sick and he went into a coma and he died and so that was always i know for me was really comforting to hear that he had someone there to meet him there's been a variety of stories i know when i have worked with hospice of um people that have said right prior to death that they have been met by um someone that is going to guide them into the afterlife or that they have talked with someone there's also a lot of stories about people who have died who have come back and and talked to uh people who are living and um the thing that i usually say when i know with um funeral service sometimes that will happen where somebody says well my husband who just died came back to me last night and talked is to say well how did that make you feel and most of the time it's a really comforting feeling sometimes it's not but very seldom is it not a comforting kind of an experience and so my my take on it is to um believe that they have experienced what they're saying at whatever level it is and i know there's a quote from harry potter who i i love the harry potter series and i can't remember exactly what the quote is but one of the characters and i won't give away if somebody hasn't read it and and wants to read the books but a character has died and harry the main character is talking to him and he says to this person who has died um are you real or is this my imagination and the person who has died said does it matter and 
so that's how I always I approach um, kind of extraordinary experiences is it's how that affects the person who is experiencing it and to acknowledge that they had and to validate that they've had that experience, whatever it is. That's wonderful. Um, usually when Harry Potter says something, it, it does <laughs> <laughs> to a lot of us. <laughs> I have quoted Harry Potter so many times in my life. <laughs> um, I'm going to turn to Rani and Aparna yeah. for this next question, um, uh, where it says, um, the person says, I'd be interested in hearing uh, from Rani and Aparna about the value of integrating movement into the process of dying and living with death, which kind of leads into what you're planning with the fires of Varanasi. May I? Um, take a moment to answer, uh, to talk about a little bit about this idea of, you talked about what to do when someone has done, you know, done harm and how do you do your rituals differently or, so <clears throat> my mother has taught me this all her life, is that all of us, every thing that we enjoy in this life or we suffer is because of our own actions not only in this life, but in our past life. So just like a computer chip, everything that we do is codified in, a, in our soul chip, which then moves on. So if someone who has um, harmed someone has died, the ritual is not going to change because the priest is just sending off that soul, just like he would do all other souls but that soul will have its, whether it has to go through many year, many lives of suffering or many lives of, or short lives of suffering, and then it, it would be removed and then they will have a better life. And also all the people around them, whether if you are around sadness, it is also because they all have that sharing they, that they have done something in order, that is why their son has done something and they are suffering because of, you know, it's that, what do you call it? The cause and effect. Because it, nothing happens without reason. You know, we talk about someone who is such a bad person, but is having a phenomenal life. It's like a bank balance, like whatever you do, you put money in the bank. As long as the money is there, you enjoy. After that, your previous karma is going to come back and you'll have to, you'll have to uh, suffer that. So I think everything that we do, as we say, whether it's um, uh, the choice of what our children and our family and our friends give us or the sadness, we are there for a reason. And we have to finish suffering that before we move on. Otherwise we'll have to come back and suffer it in other ways. So I think it has, it doesn't change any of the rituals. It may sound pretty harsh, but that's the way Hinduism believes that, you know, you see a child prodigy, he doesn't become a child prodigy without practicing. Must have worked for two, two lives in order to be born at, you know, born and play a violin at five in Carnegie Hall. There are people like that. So these are just, answers that are given to us that make our lives, make those, those questions are answered. And there is a reason. So we don't have to worry, oh, it doesn't matter whatever we do, it's going to be a terrible thing. It's not, we do good, we reap the rewards, we do bad, we have to reap the, it's not, we are not going to escape it. So that's one thing that I would like to share. About the performance, would you like to talk about it? Well, sure. So in for those of you who may not be familiar with our form, um, Bharatanatyam is traditionally a solo form. So even when we perform it as an ensemble, each of us um, uh, treats our, our portions like solos. We really um, focus on that. And the reason why I talk about that is because the form as a, and as a soloist offers incredible potential for expressing narratives. And I'm not talking about just um, stories, but also deep-seated emotions and complex emotions that we all feel. Um, Golden Uncle mentioned bhakti. 
So that, that idea of devotion or um, spirituality towards the divine, I mean, that is, is a topic that one can not only feel deeply, but they can express on the stage through movement, through gesture, facial expression. And the belief is that the dancer is the medium between this world, the audience, and the divine. And so when we communicate, we have a, a, a serious responsibility to communicate well with intention and with complete uh, involvement and truth. So when we choreograph, we uh, may not, we, we can take stories of sadness and death separation, grieving, and there is the literal story, but then there is also the emotional impact of that. Then there is perhaps the subtextual explanation there. And then the other side of it is the philosophical viewpoint, like Golden Uncle was saying, our individual soul, our longing to unite with the Paramatman or the universal soul or the the divine, um, that the sacred, that longing can be, um, is a philosophy, but it can also be a very personal feeling. And there are so many different um, poetic um, basis or literary um, sources that we use to show that over and over and over again. And it's like, um, you know, spending time with a dancer as they're on this journey. Together, the audience and the dancer experiences the longing, how, why someone is there, what is our goal, and what is that ultimate transcendence or that, um, that uh, union with the sacred that we are hoping to achieve. So those are all the themes that we can express through our movement and our form. Also, that uh, you know, the fires of Varanasi um, is about the river Ganges that flows along the city of Varanasi and how millions of Hindus go there every year. And when someone dies, the goal is that you take their ashes and Many people want to die in Varanasi. There are death hotels. People go there and stay there, wait to die. And the ashes are put in the Ganges. And they believe that by being in the Ganges, your life, the, the karma that you have done gets, you know, it, make, it, it makes your life, either you join with the uh, divine or you get better life because the deity of Varanasi is Shiva, and he supposed to like whisper in your ear, and that gives you liberation. And it's a absolute belief of a million, millions of people, and they throng to Varanasi. It's an amazing sight to see how many people, the total dedication, belief, and resilience of people, because they know this is not, this is, life doesn't end here. They have everything that they want in this life and more can be achieved by visiting and dying in Varanasi. So our store, our performance actually shows that resilience, belief that um, the devotion and all of that together, uh, as exactly as Godin said, the four parts of Hinduism is actually shown in the piece. Wonderful. Thank you so much. You know, uh, there were also connections about this notion of, uh, you mentioned about going to die at Varanasi in the sense. So almost like, I don't know, a city and a hospice, like it's a hospice city in a way, you know. Um, so I'm going to turn to the rabbi because there's some questions that I've got um, about the COVID moment, right? Like this moment where we cannot... Um, meet with our loved ones and death has visited so abruptly. So um, I guess uh, any advice, uh, uh, Rabbi, for those of us who have lost loved ones during COVID, during a time we had no warning, death was imminent and weren't able to be there before death or immediately afterwards? Yeah, this uh, is an important question. I don't know that we're gonna have the best answers um, until we continue to move forward. Um, having stood in COVID uh, patient rooms and having done prayers over the phone with uh, loved ones, 
Um, I just actually just did one right before this uh, uh, time together, uh, such as timing is. You know, um, we're talking in, at least in the Jewish community, some of the ideas that we've come up with. Um, uh, so the funerals like reverted to being online, for example, being Zoom. And so people couldn't gather at the cemetery and do um, the rituals that I talked about that are profound and healing in their own way. But we also have the, uh, whether it's on the that yard site or we have another uh, type of ceremony called a stone setting where it's uh, somewhere within the, most people wait um, about 60 to 90 days, but often they'll do it at the year anniversary as a way to regather and um, re-honor the, the time that has happened and to again, make a sort of another threshold, another step forward. I'm sort of promoting that as an opportunity to families to actually, uh, and, you know, and I'm, I'm saying this today, it's actually so interesting because I said this to people a year ago that in a year we will be together. So not quite, wow to take a breath around that reality, but um, soon to have families gather and to um, not recreate because I don't want uh, people to get um, relodged back into some of the grief work that they've healed from, but to um, find a space to be ritually moving forward. So um, we've got um, prayers that we can say again and coming together and um, maybe share memories and things that we might do, but with greater intention. We've talked about in the Jewish community is having a communal uh, service of loss and remembrance. And I know the congregation that I'm with is marking the 14th. That was our date here in Minnesota of shutdown. We're marking the 14th on Sunday with a communal gathering on Zoom uh, to talk about grief and um, loss and, and moving forward. Um, I think probably one of the, the biggest things that I say to families is um, to go ahead and get angry about the loss. Um, and that's real to get angry about being denied the rituals, because that's real. And that anger is um, healthy. If it's anger that stops your daily um, capacity to live, then that's a time you might wanna sort of think about that and, and seek out perhaps some additional help to support you through the grief process. But by acknowledging, and it's I think very similar to what Mark has said, by acknowledging the reality of these really unimaginable things that we have had to go through in a time of loss, and saying, and now what, is figuring out the and now what. Um, and the last piece I would just share, and I've um, kind of alluded to this, is that um, when in the Jewish tradition, when we're thinking about somebody who has died, um, and I say this actually to the people in my hospice that uh, are thinking, you know, the loss of their loved one, right? So where do they live? They live here. And they live in the deeds and acts that we do. So we need to find a space of closure and then a space of action that is the action of remembering them. So um, one person I suggested as soon as it got warm enough, appropriate enough is to plant tulip bulbs um, because they hibernate in the ground and then they'll come up, right? So that's, that's coming back. And maybe it sounds very much like in some ways, maybe a, a little bit along the Hindu tradition, right? So um, I said, what is the thing that they love to do? Can you participate in that activity in their name, in their memory, on their behalf? Um, and I think there's gonna be a world of creativity to continue to think about this. Thank you so much for that response. And thank you so much. I'm so, uh, you know, I I'm sad that our time together is, uh, has come to an end. Um, this has been a very profound discussion and uh, with lots of meanings, we could go on for hours on this rich topic. Um, so I wanted to thank each of the panelists, uh, Rabbi Lynn Liberman, Godan Ambatripad, Mark Markel, and Rani and Aparna Ramaswamy for all your contributions today and uh, for making it such a potent discussion that uh, I hope we can continue not only individually, but as, as a group in the future. And I also wanted to thank IAS uh, for hosting uh, this conversation uh, as part of their IAS Thursdays and for Northrop for leading us in down the path of actually the fires of Varanasi and more to come with the uh, series there. So thank you all and thank you for everyone who joined us. And thank you so much, Virajita, for your wonderful, um, your insights and bringing us all together. It's just so well. And thank you all so much. I mean, this has really just been so eye-opening for us. And I know for so many people, and it's been something we've been wanting to do for a long time. And um, we feel very moved. So thank you so much. And thank you, IAS and Kristen and Northrop.
Thank you. I also learned a lot from all of you. It was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, I, I to learn from all these other <coughs> traditions. Uh, that was great learning. Thank you. I agree. That it was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And um, come back next week and let's talk about religious identity and polarization. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, not necessarily a laughing topic. Um, thank, uh, thank you all much for to the panelists and to all of uh, our attendees and our audience. And if we didn't get to your question, I'm sorry, but um, we really appreciate such stimulating questions. See you all next week, I hope.